415 Liberty. 415. I'll be at the indoor track pool until uh, further notice, approximately half an hour to an hour. 1040. I, I thought I could change the world being a cop, being on site, talking to people. Well, I'll be honest with you, when I first got there, um, I said to myself, what the, what, to myself, what the hell am I doing here? Someone that I don't even know is driving by shooting at me? Why? They don't know me. Is it my uniform? You know, every call you go to, you think the worst. You think, am I going to die? That's, that's what they teach you. Mental health is very important, especially as a police officer. Like, you have a firearm, that's no joke. One in four police officers have a suicidal ideation in their lifetime. That's 25%. You start thinking about, you know, I'm a single dad. I started thinking about. <laughs> One of the like really turning points about that year and a half in, um, I went to a call, they called the police, you know, someone was holding someone hostage. They say whoever comes on, on site, they're gonna shoot at the police and kill them. Of course, that's me and my beat. Backup's 30, 40 minutes away. Um, so I'm, you know, going code. And so I got on site, you know, eventually, um, pretty much what happened was he shot at me, I shot at him. Both our guns jammed. Uh, we ended up getting in a fight and just wrestling and just hitting each other until I arrested him. And took him to jail and Really, I was like, man, like, you know, this guy had a lot of mental health issues. He was on drugs. And I'm trying to figure out in my head, like, did I do the right thing? Like, at the end of the day, did I do everything I could to solve that situation, protect the family, and get rid of him? Like, I almost died, and I'm worried about the guy. And so that, like, really just kind of hit home, and I'm trying to figure out in my head, like, did I do the right thing? that situation and, and just thinking about taking a life and um, you're trained to do it but when push comes to shove and you're you're faced with that and you pull the trigger and you have a dud you know almost like your life flashes before your eyes and you're getting killed by this drug dealer this guy who's hopped up he shot you know um, he shot at his wife he took her hostage like you know the situation came and it didn't work you know I just had to I mean, if it wasn't for God, I, I would probably be dead. You see the dark side of people a lot. Um, we, as cops, protect the 99% from the 1%. So 99% of people are good. 99% of people don't ever call the cops. You're never going to deal with it. But that 1% is all we deal with. There are things that are, that are troubling and, and worrisome, and, and it just shows one side of people like the not so good side you know you're dealing with everything from I mean child abuse um, you know to murder like all we see is that all of that towards the end I could really tell I was like I was just tired I just wanted to just to shut it off um, because when you're a cop you're also told and you're not to shut it off you're a cop 24 7 so even when I was off I hated leaving the house because I was a cop when I was at the grocery store. I was always thinking I was a cop. I had my gun and my badge on me the entire time. Um, when I left, if something happened, I knew I had to step in. Um, and that's what you're taught. And so that was probably the most diminishing side because then I felt like, oh, I can't leave. Or like, I'm going to walk around the mall with my wife and her friends, you know, like I have to bring my badge and my gun. Like I didn't have to, but you know, you, you want to, right? Like you're, you're, you're the, at that point, you could solve the situation or you could, you know, just let it go by. Even when I'm like off duty, I'll find myself sitting in a, like a restaurant looking at the doors to see who's coming in. You know, I'll park my, via, you know, I'll circle around a restaurant to see what might be going on or a store and park my car in a spot where I've just done a 360 before I go into that store, look in the windows, to make sure nothing crazy is going on, you just sort of get used to that mentality. That's called hypervigilance. And that, on a mental health standpoint and a physical standpoint, that is, um, can cause a lot of health and mental issues down the road.
Um, the average age of a police officer is 57 to 65, right? That's not, that's not good. Compared to the rest of the population, it was 73. Now it's 71 because we live, this is the first time in generations that people our age are passing away while their parents are still alive from suicides, overdoses. But it's not easy because when you're off duty, you're still a police officer. You, you, you know, you raise your right hand and you swore by the constitution and whatever state you're a police officer is that you're on the clock 24 seven. If something happens in front of you, you're going to take police action. When you're, when you're out and about, if something happens and you didn't do something, you kick yourself. Right. Um, so you're, you're always on in the sense that you're looking for things, you're looking at people, you're kind of like, you're waiting for someone to pull out a gun. Like in all honesty, you think of the worst, right? It's setting a boundary of, and emotionally setting a boundary of when you're on and when you're off. Because if you're always on, you're always at a 10, you're gonna hit that depressive state. You know, my, my thought process was, okay, Who's the person, you know, what's the domestic actually look like? I'd always expect the worst. Like, oh, this guy just beat his wife. She's bleeding. She's about to die. Like, I would always go to, the, like, the, the highest you could possibly go. And then when I get on site, as I start to assess it, and you kind of get a feeling, um, I would start to kind of drop my level in order to just make sure I can de-escalate the situation. You're taught to always think the worst. You know, every call you go to, you think the worst. You think, am I going to die? That's, that's what they teach you, is you go on site to any call, how, who's going to kill me or what's going to kill me, right? Police officers are always at a 9 or a 10. They're adrenaline. We're adre adrenaline junkies while we're working, because um, not every day is the same. And there's no, there's no such thing ever as a routine call if you see it in the newspaper or on the news. There's no, every car stop is different. Every situation is different. But when you come home and that adrenaline is rushing, and you're in that hypervigilant state and you sit, as you call it, the magic chair, a chair I'm sitting in, the couch, it doesn't drop progressively over time. It'll drop from a 10 to a two. Now you're watching TV, you're sitting in the magic chair, you're zoning out. You know, I, I could have been from a 10 to a two right now, just listening to what you're saying and then be like, wait, what did you just say? Where am I? I go from wanting, you know, my adrenaline spikes, someone's going to kill me to, okay, I'm just going to help someone on the side of the road or maybe put down a deer that was hit, like random things, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it, it definitely took a toll. Every day after work, I was just mentally exhausted and just physically, um, physically just exhausted, even if I didn't do much. And I, I literally didn't leave my house. When I was off, I stayed at home. Um, I slept, I read books, I did anything other than leave the house. I mean, that's partially why a lot of cops get burned out. And, they literally tell me, yeah, I just stay at home. I cut my grass. Um, they go in their swimming pool. Like a lot of cops I know um, that were probably, I, I would maybe say a little bit healthier, you know, they would do really fun activities. They would take kind of break that, you know, I'm always on. Um, they would break that away and, and focus on an activity or go into the, the lake or, you know, kind of just being being uh, almost like a normal person, right? A lot of guys' downfall is when they retire, they don't know anything else. And it's hard. And then maybe you don't have a mental health condition then, but then when everything, that hypervigilance slowly drops and you're sitting with it all the time and you've never used the right tools that we talk about at Rest for Responders, it could be a rude awakening and a really a, a dark path, which unfortunately happens a lot, man. So a lot of what a lot of cops do is when they get off a shift or they'll go out, who do you think they go out with? cops and what do they talk about cop stuff so then you go home you wake up if you are unfortunately hung over you might just be resting and not doing anything during the day then you go back to work and what do you do cop stuff then what do you do when you get out well maybe i'll just talk in the parking lot for two hours about cop stuff and it's like a process of never never ending and i call it the labyrinth in your mind right you can get caught in your own labyrinth and it's the same circle you're running all the time so i said to myself am i really am i gonna last 20 years in my hometown department where I grew up, where I knew everybody doing solo patrol for my whole career. And that was the record that was playing in my head. And uh, I started um, putting a lot of pressure on myself, couldn't make a decision, putting my pressure on myself at work. Um, and 
started getting a little bit of anxiety. And then one day it just was depression. So to cope with that depression, I started drinking from one to two days a week to almost every day. And when I went through that, um, I couldn't make a decision. Do I stay? Do I leave? You know that song, should I stay or should I go? That's the song that was in my head the whole time. Finally, after fighting it for about 10 months, I left and went back to the department where I'm at now. So I went back there. But by that time, I was uh, like a sheet in the wind, like walking dead, like a zombie. Uh, I lost 20 pounds. I stopped doing the things that I enjoyed outside of the job. Um, I was diagnosed with mental, um, mental um, major depressive disorder. And uh, I ended up checking myself into a hospital because my family was like, you can't go on like this. So I was clinically diagnosed with major depressive disorder and alcohol use disorder. A lot of police officers do resort to you know, alcohol abuse or, or there's divorce in the families and stuff like, like that because they bring the stress back and you just have to kind of learn to, to deal with that. So finally, September 23rd of 2019 was the last time I had a drink. So I just hit 18 months sober. And I realized in that time frame, in the year of 2019, NYPD had 12 suicides, department alone. There was 228 police suicides countrywide. Now, if you check on the stats, it actually increased with more data coming up. It, it was 238 or 239. Don't quote me on that, but definitely one of those numbers. That's just in 2019 alone. One in four police officers have a suicidal ideation in their lifetime. That's 25%, one in four, um, while they're working or when they're retired. 30% of first responders, and this is quoted from SAMHSA from a study, who knows how many first responders they had in the study, but 30% of them suffer from PTSD, anxiety, or depression compared to 20% of a non-first responder or the everyday citizen. In 2020, it was 171 police officers lost their life to suicide. Um, divorce rate is one of the highest in, out of all the professions for police officers. It's tough, you know, just from what I gave you there is, uh, and I think it's not exposed so much because uh, it's still the fear of losing their job and fear of, uh, and it's like that, well, I'm a big bad cop or I'm a big bad SWAT, uh, SWAT officer. Because a lot of guys, especially older guys, um, they, they it, I don't know if it's the macho thing or something, or like John Wayne, they don't want to admit that they, they need help because they might think it's a sign of weakness, so they'll be like, man, I'm good, when in reality they might be torn up inside. You almost didn't like want to be vulnerable, you know, you wanted to kind of be that tough guy. I can't ask for help, right, man? I'm a cop. If I ask for help, my gun and shield's taken away, that's like uh, getting you-know-what taken away. You know, it's like, especially, um, and I'll put it in quotes, you know, um, in today's society of what a man should be and all that, right? You're a man, you can't do that. There is that tough guy persona. Um, you have to be tough, you have to stand for it. You don't have, you don't have emotions, right? Like you just do it. You don't cry or suck it up, you know, pansy. What do you want to dress? Should I put some earrings on you? Things like that. And it's like, you can't talk to people like that, you know? That, that was 80, 90 years ago. It was almost this unspoken, you just deal with it yourself, you know, however you deal with it. Um, if you talk about it, that's fine. You know, people give advice, but not many people like to talk about it. It led me to a really dark journey. I call it the gates of hell. I was there. And um, I didn't realize that people were suffering like I was. And I use that word suffering because I was suffering. But in, my, in the beginning, I was like, if I do this, I'm done. The fear that maybe police officers had if they admitted that they had an issue with whether it's alcohol or something, that they might be like, well, now, now they're on to me. I might lose my job. Even a lot of the older guys, I mean, they never wanted to talk about anything. Um, you kind of brushed it under the rug. I mean, no one talks to their wives. Like it, when I came home, I never talked to my wife. She knew everything she knows is from now now that I'm talking to her about it. Does your wife want to really worry about you every day? You know, now you're putting all that pressure on her. So you, you tend not to tell people, um, you bottle it up. And then, I mean, yeah, the more I bottled it up, the more I stress I felt, the more I felt on edge, the more, um, you know, kind of my mental health started to, to go from functional to, am I really thinking right? Am I in the right, you know, mindset? 
But it comes back to a lot of guys, especially the older ones, have this, like, that's a sign of weakness. And the last thing that you want to hear is you hear that an officer took his life because he was too proud to ask for help. Yeah, I mean, some of the hardest times at, at Bedford, I could go to my, my squad and say, hey, guys, this is what happened. How do I process this? You know, and, and really kind of dive into, did I do the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? How do I move past this? How do I um, take everything that just happened and become a better cop? Doing it in the, when I was struggling in the beginning, I said to myself, there's no way I can ask for help. What are everyone going to say about me? No one's ever going to trust me again. I'll never be a cop. All that stuff was going through my head, and I believed it. Um, and asking for help was the best thing I ever could have done. Yeah, there's ups and downs, and you have to say, hey, you know, they take your gun and shield away. You get better. I am now the 10 times better a police officer, um, boyfriend, son, friend, human being than I was even before when I got on the job. So some of these younger officers, I think, have, have gotten accustomed to it's okay to reach out and say, you know, I could really talk to somebody. There's no, there's no weakness in that. To be sort of subtle and let them know that you're there without like having like an Oprah moment with them or something like that. Like, hey man, you know, if you need anything, just let me know. If you work with someone long enough, you know when something's bothering them. And it might have been an incident that the two of you are familiar with or you are aware of what he encountered. So you reach out to them and say, Hey, if you want to talk, you want to come over, grill out or something like that, that's an option. And that's, that's a guy way of saying, hey, I'm here for you. I, I still think about this scenario. I, I was shot at. Me and an, uh, a sergeant were walking in Richmond, and we're walking a beat, and a car drives by probably a little further than that wall over there, 60 feet. Almost at the same time, you see the shot, you hear the shot, and you feel it going by you. And, you know, just sitting here, my hands get clammy. It missed both of us. And the car continued to go, took a ride on Broad Street, and probably got on either 64 or 95 and was gone. Didn't, didn't know them from Adam, wasn't bothering them. So whether they just drove by, saw two police officers decide to shoot, thank God it missed both of us. That gives you a greater appreciation of things. Yeah, I, right after that, I, I think I was done for the shift. I think we just told somebody and then we were pretty much let go and then people reached out to us and stuff like that. Again, that's important. They follow up with you, make sure you're okay and stuff like that. And yeah, because I'm walking this way. If, if something comes through here, you know, this is good for the front and the back, but through the side or the head, headshot, I'm, I'm gone. You start thinking about, you know, I'm a single dad. I started thinking about <laughs> uh, my two kids, you know, my sisters and my parents, and it's like, you know, just like that. Don't know that person from Adam. I'm, well, I'm just walking with another officer. I don't even remember what we were talking about. Probably small talk. Maybe there was a pause in the conversation. I don't even remember. I just remember seeing the car, seeing the flash, hearing it, and going by all like that. So in a split second, I could have, he, he could have been hit, I could have been hit, or they, they could have fired off another shot. But I'm like, going back to earlier, I'm here to safeguard lives and property, and someone that I don't even know is driving by shooting at me? Why? They don't know me. Is it my uniform? Don't know. Don't know who they are. So, yeah, that, that, that was years ago, and I, you know, I didn't realize until you were asking me that, that it still affects me. I didn't let the stress get to me. It, it actually made me more appreciative and thankful that neither one of us got hit. I, I pray for that. I imagine at least two people in the car, because one guy was driving and this guy was, the gun was out the window, unless he had an extremely long arm. <laughs> um, but I think that's the biggest thing I got out of that, is to realize how awesome life is and to, to recognize the sanctity of each 24-hour period. You know, this is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad and I rejoiced that neither one of us got hit. 
I was told this years ago, the reason the Dead Sea, it's called the Dead Sea, or maybe a reason, is it has no outlets. It, it takes all this stuff in, but it, it doesn't, there's no movement. It just retains, retains, retains. There's no, there's no outlets, so it can't sustain much life in there. Maybe some stuff way down at the bottom or something like that. And we as people need to have outlets. The Bible says in a multitude of counselors there's safety. And that, that, that old school John Wayne mentality needs to stop where officers can, can, can sit down and talk to somebody about what they're going through or, hey man, I had a hard time dealing with that. Instead of hearing something on the news where an officer took his life, when it's like, God, I had no idea. Maybe all it would have taken was you sent something and said, hey, text me sometime or let's cook some burgers on the grill. Let's go bowling. Again, a lot of times guys keep things in because I think they might think it's a sign of weakness to say that something really impacted them negatively. If you need to ask for help, do it, but do it the right way before something, ha in my mind, the right way, before you do something that gets out of hand, where find someone that you trust in your department and hopefully you have that one person. If not, talk to someone on the side and be honest with yourself and admit, hey, you know, this job, I'm having a hard time right now. I've been doing it for a long time or I've been doing it for a year or five years. It's taking a toll on my body. Um, I'm powerless over this right now. So how can I get my power back? So you don't have to be another statistic. I wake up every day, say I refuse to be a statistic to this job and I refuse to be a statistic to alcohol. And that's just something I say to remind myself every day. So just for today, I'm not going to do that. And then when tomorrow wakes up and hopefully I wake up, I'll say the same thing because we're living in right now. Nothing else matters to us right now. This is what's real, this is reality. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess that's. Officer Brown, it's been a pleasure Thank meeting you. you.